Ben Shapiro, I just had a quick question for you. So I, I have a question. Want... Can I see your face, or is it like prohibited? Um, I just don't want to associate my face with like my politics. Is there a reason for that? I just don't want like worried about my career. Is that okay? Um, well, it depends about what you're what you're about to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so can I just ask it? Okay. Yeah, you, you can ask it, and then we'll determine whether, uh, whether you are a, a person who should not be able to get a job. Okay. Sure. <laughs> okay. So, so, I just want to know, how hard was it to, like, generate, generate like, AI-generated images of Hamas? So, you should take off your mask now. Not, not really because what you're saying is so anti-Semitic, but just because what you're saying is so unbelievably stupid that I hope employers take a good stock of a person who does something so dumb. Oh my gosh, Ben Shapiro can be so blunt, so blunt, goodness. Hey Veracity, welcome back to the channel, the girl very more. I'm back with another reaction video. Today I'll be reacting to Ben Shapiro and we have Max student gets rocked by Ben Shapiro at, why, well, at YAF TV. Let's go. So the, no, no Matt. No, mask stays on? Mask stays on, yeah, I figured. Okay, there was no AI-generated image. It is a real image. The way that the game works on Twitter right now, because it's been taken over by a lot of Hamas bots, is that if you put a real image of an atrocity, they will then spam that image with community notes. And they'll do that until the algorithm puts a community note on the image. And then they will screen cap the community note and pretend that the image was AI-generated. That image was not only a not AI-generated, it was handed to Tony Blinken. That, Im that, that image was specifically, I, I wasn't the first person to put it out there. That image was tweeted out by the Prime Minister of Israel. So, like, a, again, this is a, the, the amount of, of just insane bullshit that's being trafficked in this, in this information war is truly astonishing. And the fact that there are people who don't want to show their faces, but they do want to say things like that. You know, again, you know, I, you know, I, let's just leave it, we'll leave it at that. This does not appear to be a highly intelligent specimen. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Ben. Oh my gosh. I can't even believe I'm talking to you right now. I'm such a big fan. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I like the shirt, by the way. That's very thank funny. You. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so right after 9-11, the whole country united. Do you believe that there has to be a large-scale terror attack like 9-11, God forbid, um, to unite the Americans or the American youth specifically? in patriotism, or is all hope lost for a united nation? Um, I hope that it doesn't take something like that. And frankly, I'm not sure that a mass terror attack in a specific area of the country would do it. I think that the, the reality is that maybe the only thing that can unite the American people at this point is a true existential foreign threat. So Israel is a good example of this just because what's happening right now is a true existential threat to the state of Israel. It's not just a massive terror attack. Israel's experienced many of those. It's that Israel has, on multiple borders, serious existential threats. In the United States, we are the luckiest people in the history of the world. Seriously, America is blessed by God. We have on two sides the ocean. That's true economically, and it's true morally. It's just it's an amazing place. But geographically speaking, we're blessed on two sides by ocean, one side by Canadians and one side by Mexicans. And so what that means is that there are no true existential threats to the United States, and we don't tend to feel it that way. And what usually causes unity is a feeling of existential threat, which is why, since the fall of the Soviet Union, there really has been no serious internal unity in the United States. Now, it's unfortunate that that's sometimes what it takes. The, the, the threat of a rising China could theoretically create something like that. But it's, you know, I, I think that the, the future of the United States, if we are to unify in a way that doesn't require serious violence, which God forbid, uh, then I think that what's going to have to happen is a devolution of authority to more local levels, a minimization of the federal government, and then everybody's just going to be like, okay, I don't really care as a person in Wisconsin what's happening in California, and I don't really care as a person in Florida what's happening in California, and vice versa. And that way we can say, okay, you know, we have sort of a baseline level of things that we agree with, things like free speech or freedom of practice of religion, and otherwise we're just going to leave each other alone. That's the only way that you're going to get true unity in the United States, but I mean, yes, I think that as the country divides, the seriousness of what it would take to, to bring us back together grows, and that's, that's a scary thing for sure. Thank you, you're the best. Thank you. <laughs> the world has obviously witnessed heinous attacks by Hamas terrorists against innocent Israeli civilians. The most recent attack was massive, it was devastating, killed over 1,500 Israeli men, women, children, babies. Thousands more have been injured. 200 are being held hostage after being kidnapped. The sworn enemy of Israel and the Jews will stop at nothing to slaughter every last Jew, obviously, but 
there is something you can do. The International Fellowship of Christians and Jews is on the ground right now, providing critical essentials like food, medicine, and other emergency supplies for vulnerable Jews who need immediate help. The need is urgent. This organization needs your help right now. To donate, please go to benforthefellowship.org. Give as generously as you can. Write it down. That is benforthefellowship.org. Again, I've been making recommendations on many places that you can give. One of the best places you can give is the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. They're helping people on the ground right now in Israel. There's tremendous need. There are families that have been absolutely like, completely destroyed. Tons of new orphans, tons of new widows, tons of people who are in desperate need. Head on over to benforthefellowship.org. And if you have money in your wallet or the inclination, please give generously, benforthefellowship.org. Whenever conservatives talk about the Middle East, they all they often like to champion around the superiority of Western values, those of freedom of expression, freedom of speech. I agree wholeheartedly with all of these things. But I think we've seen in a couple months prior to this, for anyone with a good memory, uh, that conservatives have been, in a certain way, very much against freedom ex- of expression, specifically a certain kind of expression, which is, I would say, gender expression. Uh, you on your show a couple months ago said that you thought it was fine for sort of local municipalities to say a law that would ban women women from wearing a type of clothing that men wear or men wearing a type of clothing that women wear would not be sort of in the bounds of the First Amendment because the First Amendment refers to laws made by Congress. So I'm wondering, with these sort of anti-drag laws, with laws that might uh, ban people from wearing certain types of clothing, do not do these not go against these sort of uh, Western values of freedom of expression that conservatives usually champion and the freedom for LGBT people when we talk about in comparison to the Middle East as we have just done in this sort of... So it's a, it's a great question. I don't believe in freedom of expression. I believe in freedom of political speech. There's a difference. The founders believed in freedom of political speech as well. That didn't mean that you got to dress up naked get on a street corner, right? Because the fact is that everything can theoretically be considered a form of expression. And even people who are ardent libertarian fans of freedom of expression understand that there are limits to what counts as expression, but nobody can agree on exactly what those limits are. As far as what I've said about local localism, one of the things that I'm very big on, obviously, is localism. And we see this in, for example, in HOA. In your HOA, in our HOA, for example, you can't just post anything you want in your window. There's an agreement with the people who live in the neighborhood that you're not allowed to just put whatever you want on your front lawn. You can't just park a rusted van on your front lawn, for example. There's nothing that violates freedom of expression or freedom of speech about that. That's what your local community has decided. Now, as you abstract that out, to a broader and broader level, the freedom has to grow from that level of government because there is less homogeneity as you move up the chain. So I'm very much in favor of the idea that local communities get to make decisions for themselves on a local level, but as you abstract up the chain with more and more people who are not like you, the government has to take a lighter and lighter hand. So when it comes to, for example, broad statements like freedom of speech or freedom of expression, I would say that not every space, I mean, the Supreme Court has said this, not every space is created equivalent in these circumstances, right? In your apartment building, you can't just stand in the bottom floor and hand out political literature very often, right? I mean, the the person who runs the apartment building will kick you out. You're not allowed to do that. There are certain spaces that are considered okay for this and certain spaces that are not considered okay for this. So the idea, again, that there's sort of a flat, one-size-fits-all freedom of speech provision, and it doesn't rely on place, and it doesn't rely on locality, and it doesn't rely on level of government, it it doesn't speak to how government actually works or the aspirations of of human beings. I think, for example, that zoning laws are a pretty great way of preventing, quote unquote, freedom of expression. And I think that local communities should be able to, for example, not have a pot shop directly next to a school. And it's a pretty significant encroachment on on the pot shop's freedom of expression. They can't even sell their pot right next to the school. But again, I think that we, we we, we understand that when it comes to local communities making rules for themselves, because you have the ability to do what I did, right? I didn't like the rules in California, so I got up and I moved. In the United States, I can't really do that, right? That's why I'm very, very skeptical of free speech laws at the federal level, but I'm much less skeptical when it comes to a local school board deciding what it wants to teach. If I don't like it, I can always move to the next town. Yeah. Uh, I mean, some of those don't really fit within the bounds. If you want to talk about, like, an apartment building, obviously that's a private residence. Free speech doesn't really apply there. Okay, but there are time, space, and manner restrictions even at the University of Wisconsin, right? Uh, sure. There right, I mean, there's is. a public school in here. If you protest right now and you start screaming and disrupting, they'll take you out. That's that's expression. Yeah, um, but I I wonder if like let's say you had a neighborhood in California. They said you know we're really offended by all of these mag ads. We're gonna ban you if you maybe a city, maybe even a state did this. Like if you wear one, we're gonna throw you in jail. Obviously, we're opposed to this. I'm not sure I if I get the argument that like the more you shrink it down, the less freedoms you have. Well, the more you shrink it down, the more the more ability you have to shape the community around you. In your family, for example, you have a lot of ability to shape the community around you. As far as MAGA hats, again, when it comes to core political expression, that is what the founders were attempting to preserve. And I think that we've now broadened that out to include everything up to and including your ability to view pornography, which I don't consider core political expression, and neither were the founders. Um, 
Well, it's kind of an interesting point. I wonder if political expression, just your ability uh, to like wear certain things, even the act of wearing those things, you could argue, is like sort of a form of protest against the ability to wear these things. Uh, for example, uh, Matt Walsh, who's you know kind of a I know a friend of yours. Uh, you've said you've hated him several times, so you know. Oh, no, no, sure. no. Knowles, I hate. Walsh, I'm indifferent about. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Um, he once, so I remember Lizzo had some drag queens on stage and he said like lock her up because there was an anti-drag bill in Tennessee, but I would say that's sort of a, I would think it's fair to say she was making a political statement. Well, the, the anti, the, she was making a political statement. The anti-drag bill was directed at exposure in front of children, mm -hmm. right? That's what the law actually was. It was exposure of people dancing in, in sexualized outfits in front of children. That's, that's what it was. And so she was doing it in front of kids. If she did it in front of adults, I think that's protected by the First Amendment. But yeah. you can see, like, bottom line, I don't think your question's bad. I just think that it's a little messier than I think that everybody wants to make it out to be. Sure. I, I'm not sure with the, um, the, the whole children thing. Um, I want, okay. Um, but it's like, I don't know how much we can sort of shrink, like, expression when it comes to kids. Like, I'm very skeptical of, like, um, like ratings for movies, for comics, the comics code. Like, how much can we shrink free speech just because children are watching? Oh, I think like, an awful lot. I mean, depending on how exactly we're appealing to kids, I think it's very, very important. I appreciate the, okay. I appreciate the question. Wow, the guy behind the max is just hilarious. I think behind the max is a sign of being a coward, actually, a masked coward. <laughs> Unemployable for sure. So it's like he's wearing the mask to protect himself because he knows what he's about to say. Because he knows what he's saying is actually crazy. I wouldn't accept a masked person in any debate. So the masked guy just admitted that he's such an horrible person. <laughs> and he definitely has to max is identity because i mean the fact that he's already wearing a max shows that he has nothing useful to say i mean how late i love the way bell is always so straightforward <laughs> so blunt and so direct come on Anyways, i wouldn't blame him i would also love to hide my face when saying something stupid the fact that he feels he needs to wear a max to hide his face <laughs> not just from ben but from also his future boss Oh my god, hilarious. Oh my god, this was amazing. What are your thoughts on this? What do you guys think about this video? Drop your comment down below. If you enjoyed this video, give it a huge thumbs up. Please share this video. If you're new to the channel, join the RCC. Hit subscribe button below. Turn on the post notification bell so that you can always be the first person to know whenever a new video drops. And with that, guys, see you in my next one. Bye.